Thank you. So admittedly, I was a little bit nervous going after the lawyer, um, especially given that we work on medical devices. So <laughs> I know you didn't touch too much on medical technology, but hopefully you know, we should probably talk after. Um, so thank you, Dr. DeVry, for the invitation. This is really a pleasure to be here. Um, much better view than I have from any laboratory or workshop um, in Boston. So this is really fantastic. Um, as she mentioned, I work at MIT in, in a couple of different hats. Um, one, teaching a course in D-Lab, um, for, mostly for undergraduate students on how do you design uh, medical technology for really extreme environments. The second uh, two positions are research lab positions where we're both designing in the lab, but then also taking devices um, to countries that we collaborate in around the world. So today I'm going to give you just a brief overview in the context in which we work and how we design and why we're, we're designing the types of technologies that we do. Um, a few case studies and examples of just what we're working on now in the laboratory and then leave some just questions and, and, and conversations that I'm really excited about having the next few days with the um, really well accomplished surgeons, medical professionals, academic students, and, and everybody in the room. Uh, so we've all seen roads like this. Um, we've all either traveled on them or you've seen patients coming from them. This isn't unique to one country. This is all over the world. And the real challenge that we see in global health is how do you treat patients here? A really great school of thought for um, a systemic change in, in, in public health is everything should be in this direction, and this is what we're aiming for, being able to implant this, this standard of care and access around the world. This is great, and in 10 to 20 years down the road, um, transportation over, over roads like this really will make a difference for patients. But what our lab is interested in is in the meantime, how do we design the Land Rover of, of medical devices and medical care that can actually treat patients now? Dr. Rhodes gave some fantastic examples of, of his work in actually bringing um, the operating room over as a Land Rover device. Um, and, and, and being able to treat patients there. So not only is, is there's the challenge of how do you, how do you bring care to patients um, in these environments, but there is medical equipment that exists there. Um, our friend Bob Malkin at Duke University just released a study last year that showed that hospitals and clinics and health centers around the world that receive medical technology, within six months, 90%, almost 90% of this equipment has failed. This isn't a surprise to anybody in the room. It wasn't designed for these environments. There's consumables that cannot be replaced. One screw goes missing and the microscope gets tossed out back. But healthcare providers in these environments are still providing care. They're dreaming up solutions, they're MacGyvering solutions, they're sometimes scrounging through these landfills and, and looking for what might still be useful and piecing things together to come up with a solution to treat patients because the alternative, there is no alternative. So for us, we're both excited by the opportunity to design technologies that from the start were meant to operate in these environments and also to identify who are those healthcare professionals that are coming up with solutions, that are already designing better ways to treat their patients um, in these countries and how can we give them better tools so that they can continue inventing and creating and, and, and MacGyvering, but to make the devices safer, to scale them, and to share them so that doctors in Nigeria can share their devices with nurses, nurses in Ethiopia. Um, so a few quick examples. Um, this is one of my friends in, from Nigeria. His name is Dr. Yambo Awajobi. Um, and some of you actually um, in, in the global surgery arena may have met him or seen him before, but so these are some of the devices that Dr. Awajobi has created in his hospital. Um, he's not only created the devices, actually, but the hospital itself. Um, he built and built the, the windows in such a way that you have natural ventilation that keeps rooms at, at, at a, a sustainable temperature. Um, he has an operating lamp made from a, a salad bowl. He has the centrifuge made from a bicycle, the operating table made from a car jack, autoclaves um, that are powered by corn cobs, and, and he's this really fantastic, prolific inventor that is not waiting for the system to mature, but is actually treating patients now with locally made machinery that can be repaired um, with supply chains that exist in, in Arua, Nigeria. 
And this idea of invention and, and creativity and, and coming up with solutions is not unique to developing countries. It's actually how a lot of medical technology began. This is a picture of uh, Dr. Andreas Grunswig's assistant who's prototyping the first uh, balloon catheter for coronary angioplasty in, in 1974. Really fantastic example, um, Earl Bakken, founder of Medtronic, prototyping the first wearable pacemaker that went within four, from four weeks from a prototype that he was testing in a garage workshop next to the, to the University of Minnesota Hospital to a patient in the hospital because the director needed a way to treat these patients and when the electricity was going out and needed something to be portable in a solution that worked just there. So arguably, these, out of these three examples, you have the latter two that led to revolutions in how technology was, is used in healthcare today and in procedures that, that are used in hospitals around the world. But with Dr. Awajobi, he's making an enormous impact on the patients that he sees and treats in his hospital, but the ideas and the inventions and the fabrications stay there. And there's no... You know, if we wanted to bring one of his devices to an, um, one of the sites that you're working at around the world, it would take some real pulling of uh, you know, nagging him, how do we get this, how do we make this, what did you, what, what testing have you done, um, to get that information from him. Uh, so at Little Devices Group, there's three um, paths that we're, we're looking at to both address that, that challenge that um, you know, how do we harness this local ingenuity and spread this? Um, and then also, how do we divine co-design devices that are, are meant for these environments? And the latter I'll just touch on briefly at the end, which is how do we crowdsource epidemiology um, in global healthcare? Uh, so there's four uh, quick exam case study examples that I'll go through, starting with uh, our Medikit project. So this is a medical education design and invention kits, a construction set kit. Um, we've seen inventive, inventive healthcare around the world, and these are a couple of the different sites that we've worked. And in these different sites, we meet people such as Daniela Orvina. She's from Esteli, Nicaragua, and this is her stethoscope that she, that broke. And the diaphragm, the, the part where that's hearing the vibrations broke and, and she had no way, there, it, it's, it's a device that she couldn't operate, she couldn't work without in, in her health center. So she went around the clinic to try to find different parts that, and materials that could be used in place. And she tried x-ray slides, she tried plastic bags, she tried um, tubing, she tried everything, and then landed upon what you see there in, in that little picture, um, which is a transparency slide. You can still even see the pink scribbles from the lecture the day before. And it's really not a pretty solution. I mean, you can see it's masking taped, it's hacked together, um, but it works. And she was able to continue treating and seeing patients. And this took us two hours to convince her to take this picture because not only, she knew that it was a hack together solution, she was embarrassed. Um, when we were just thrilled and excited to see that somebody in, in Nicaragua had actually come up with their own solution for how, how to fix the medical devices. So we took um, the example of, of Daniela and her lack of just really interchangeable parts and materials and, and, and being able to come up with solutions on the spot. And that really spawned um, the, the Medikit project, the design and invention kits. And we're looking at democratizing how do people prototype devices um, if they don't have a lab, their own lab or workshop and setting. Um, and one key uh, device that has come from, from the Medikit project is um, a nebulizer, so you may be familiar with this used to treat asthmatic patients. Um, this device, if, if you want to buy it locally, is, is between $60 to $80, um, and even once you buy it, you need to have electricity to run it, and if it's not a really clean environment, it's going to clog up, the filters will clog up with dust, and the electronic parts will break fairly quickly. Um, but these can say, will we'll save a life. They're both used both for therapeutic treatment um, daily or they're used in, in case of, of an asthma attack. So for us, we thought of how can we approach this nebulizer technology with locally, both locally available materials and augment that with a, a kit of parts that would enable healthcare workers and patients around the world to design their own devices. And what we came up with was this pedal-powered nebulizer 
um, which is about as simple as it looks in this picture, where um, we use the, the, the kit of parts that you saw previously, augmented it with a locally available bicycle pump, and gave uh, doctors, nurses, nurses and, and uh, parents of patients a way to treat um, kids in an emergency if there's no other solution available. It may not be the best option for regular therapy as it does require manual labor for 15 to 20 minutes to operate, but if there's no other option and you are either stuck in the mountain with your child and, and, and going to wait the hour and a half to get to the hospital, this will allow you to treat them on the spot right there. Um, we've done test, simulation tests on the particles to make sure that we're getting the right rates, um, and that went really, really well also. Um, so this is an example of doctors and nurses in Nicaragua who were prototyping with the nebulizer kit. And what's really exciting about this picture for us is that the nurses were actually showing the doctor how to make the, the, the nebulizer, and that doesn't happen in, in the in the trainings that we do, that doesn't happen very often, so this was uh, just a really exciting moment to see that happen, that they were so confident in how to make it immediately that they were able to give the instruction um, to her. Uh, so the medic architecture, um, there's a couple of other examples, both in diagnostics and vital signs and microfluidics, and I brought some of them with me, so this afternoon I'm happy to talk more and, and show some of those, but um, we have the core blocks, um, modifiers, so how do you modify the technology, and what, um, such as the bike pump, what locally available material can we incorporate into these so that when a part breaks, it's not a matter of waiting for the supply chain or somebody from a remote part of the Ministry of Health to send that material, but actually you can, if it's that important and it's that needed and it's going to treat patients, you can walk down the street to the, the hardware store to, to find that part. Uh, we also, we think a lot about supply chains and medical devices, and both when we're prototyping them and then when we're deploying them as well. And it turns out that toys have an amazing supply chain. So this always boggles my mind that you can find a Game Boy in any part of the world, and now cell phones with games in any part of the world, but we come across hospitals in Nicaragua where you have three hospitals or health centers that are sharing one glucometer. And that boggles my mind how that supply chain happens. But instead of spending all your energies and efforts trying to fix that supply chain, we're working with what we have and looking at what toys are available and that, that what supply chains for toys are available and how can we harness the mechanisms and the electronics from these toys to make medical devices. Um, so this was a medic class in Nicaragua in Hinotepe, and we took, so we took the group to the toy store and asked them to pick out a few uh, toys that they would like to incorporate into medical devices and gave them the challenge, a, a one-day challenge of, of designing an alarm for an IV bag, so an, an alarm that would go off when an IV bag reached a certain weight so that the nurses, instead of checking each individual bag, would just be able to triage once they heard the alarm. So after a day of prototyping, um, they turned this toy AK-47 into an alarm using clothespins and rubber bands and springs that were at the right tension um, for when the bag was about a, an eighth, there was still an eighth of the bag left, the alarm would go off, and so the nurse would know to go and check on the patient. Um, and they're using it. They're using, it's not, I mean, this is not, they're not prototyping an invasive device that's getting used immediately, but it's something that is helping them to provide better care in the hospital. Um, so here's just a couple of other examples of, of prototypes that, that we've um, made with, with nurses and doctors for the supply chains of centrifuge. We have an inhaler um, with the helicopter and that uh, toy teddy bear in the bottom corner. Um, we embedded a pulse oximeter into that so that um, children, if you're taking a, a, the pulse of a child, there's it's a little bit more fun and therapeutic for them. Um, so this is, and this is one of the diagnostic kits that we have. We've had, I mean, this with this project in particular, some really interesting traction, um, both with the Inter-American Development Bank for Funding and then the Smithsonian Design Museum, which was a, a unique collaborator um, for us on, on this. Uh, the next project, which is a, actually a co-design technology that we have, is SolarClave. 
Um, so, so this is not news to, to anybody here, but uh, in developing countries, patients have a one in five risk of, of receiving, of having an infection after but either a minor or a major procedure, um, some of the estimations. And we heard from Dr. DeVry earlier about some of the things that, that do cause that can lead to this, um, one of those being improper sterilization techniques for tools. So our team has been working uh, with, closely with collaborators in Nigeria and Ethiopia, or sorry, Nigeria and Nicaragua to address that with technology. And the solution in these given contexts was both just a small load pressure cooker, this was for um, care and, and procedures in really rural clinics, so not major um, surgeries, but they're looking at emergency births, suturing, stitches, um, and, and, and the instruments that are needed for, for all of those prenatal care as well. Um, so this was, has last year, some of our early prototyping um, that we were doing in Nicaragua. And this is, I, I think this picture really defines what we mean by co-developed technologies, where if you see the device on the right-hand side of the screen that everybody is bent over, that's the one that we brought from MIT that actually looks, you know, it's held up by broomsticks and isn't really as put together nice. And the device on the far left, the one that's standing fine on its own, is the one that our collaborators in Nicaragua made. So we communicated back and forth over email about some of the ideas for a device design and spoke to them about what we were working on, gave them the schematics for the reflector on the bottom, and they came up with this device um, in sort of a wheelbarrow fashion where we were still actually working on, 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 on our actual um, system to hold everything together. So it was a really great opportunity for us to learn from the ideas and the, um, that the nurses and the manufacturing groups in Nicaragua had for a device. And this is the current state um, there's the pressure cooker that is focused above the reflectors, and the reflectors are focusing uh, the light onto the bottom of the pressure cooker and reaching 121 degrees in about um, a little over 45 minutes with a really clear sky. Um, this is being piloted, not in a clinical study, but in an engineering field trial. So we just have nurses who are doing robustness tests with the device right now in Nicaragua to really understand can this withstand the, the elements, the climate, and the usability um, uh, for healthcare workers. A, si a second example of co-design technology is a centrifuge. Um, so this, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Dr. Awajobi had invented a bicycle-powered centrifuge to power his, the, the lab samples in his lab in Arua. And when I went to visit him, we talked about it a little bit, and it works great for him because he has the space for a device with a large footprint. But to replicate and scale this into other places around the world, something is needed that is much smaller. Um, and then arguably, so the place where the sample is held is at the bottom, bottom left of the wheel, so you can't see it because it's spinning right now, but there's no real closure for, enclosure for where the samples are. So while it's functioning, it's been working for him for 12 years, there was some concern about the safety of, uh, of, of people in the laboratory that were using this. So we brought this back to MIT, and uh, uh, I guess uh, another class similar to D-Lab Health is called D-Lab Design, taught by one of my colleagues, um, Nathan Cook, and he recruited some students to collaborate with Dr. Awajobi on this design. Um, and there's uh, universities across the country that are doing really great work in global health projects with international collaborators and, and students, whether it's engineering or medical students. Um, and so I know I'm not alone when I say that, that there's this true heartache when you, when you spend all this time building a partnership and, and getting a prototype and a device up and running with students, and then everybody goes in different directions. And the doctor is still on the other line waiting for his device or the idea or, or, or what, what have you. And, and, and students, because this is, that's the nature of being a student, is, um, are moving on or, or working in, in other areas as well. And that's, that's what you do in your students. So this, so I told Nathan about that concern coming into this and, and it was really incredible what happened because you, you can see there was an email chain between Dr. Awajobi and the students about how do we improve the centrifuge. Um, and then instead of Dr. Awajobi waiting for the students to design something, he started sending them emails about his ideas and his prototyping. And so then it was this race to, <laughs> to make a prototype. And he was building one in Nigeria, and they were building one in Boston. And, and everyone, every email that they exchanged that they had, there was a different idea that came out of it. Um, they wanted to use a power cord to drill. And he said, that's interesting, but 
there's, those are hard to find actually. And even if those aren't hard to find, it's the batteries that are hard to find. And there's no electricity in my laboratory. So I don't know how we would actually run that. And then he came back with these, some of these hand drill devices that he um, tried to incorporate into it. And so you'll see at the end, that's um, at the top end, that is uh, this, the MIT student's final device. Um, that is great. This is, we actually still have this at MIT, but um, one of the more exciting things is this is Dr. Awajobi's end device um, that he is not only now using in his laboratory, but he's publishing papers on um, some of his own, the, the ACE Hospital publication, and then he just presented at a conference in London as well. So this to us is a just really exciting story about how you can foster a local and international collaboration and, and really empower the person who's in, going to be in Nigeria working on this to give them the tools and ideas and parts to have a solution that is up and running before um, students can find funding to travel down there um, to, to launch that. Um, and the last uh, project they'll speak to really briefly um, is Crowdio. Um, so, and this was the, the crowdsource epidemiology. So we're looking at how do you collect um, information f um, in real time. Uh, this one is uh, specifically for diagnostics. Uh, so there are a couple examples of this. Flu Trends, Google, Google Org is doing a great job of, of giving us some information about that. Um, but when we look at something like dengue, it doesn't really even, sh it doesn't show up on the eastern part of, of, of South America, and we know that that truly is an issue there. We can, let's see, this, this is a map of how dengue is spreading. Um, it's a virus transmitted by a mosquito bite is fatal for one in four patients. Tremendous issue with how we, both how we diagnose it and then how we treat patients who have this. Uh, so, in, in especially in, in developing country areas. Uh, so for this, we've been, uh, designing and developing in collaboration with uh, Professor Gerke's lab, a multiplex diagnostics that generates a code, you can see the, the QR code on, on, on the bottom left, that can be scanned by a cell phone and create real-time maps of how diseases are spreading and, and where they're spreading to. Um, we didn't start prototyping this with dengue, though. Um, we started with water. And, and this is actually, uh, I brought a few of these today to show um, later, but these are water testing kits that can be assembled, scanned by cell phone, and results populated to a map. Um, so this is, we piloted it in Berlin and have test results from Nicaragua and Panama as well on how we're using these. So um, with that, I'll, I'll end so we, um, we can hear more from, from other speakers, um, but look forward to hearing both thoughts, ideas, and feedback and um, on, on this work and the rest of, of your work here. Thank you.